certainly um, that's what I'm experiencing. I just got here yesterday. Um, I was saying that I got up for a flight that left at 6 a.m. I had to get up at 3 a.m. And I thought I'd sleep really well last night, but I woke up my usual time, my New York time, so I woke up at 3 o'clock this morning. So forgive me, I'm a little jet lagged, um, and so any mistakes I made were due to that. Um, I'm here today to offer some thoughts about the important diversity, equity, and inclusion work that deans, uh, people like Dean Levine do, and the kind of work others provide. But I'm not going to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is known, as you all know, as DEI. I'm not going to talk about it in the law school setting. I'm going to talk about it in the for-profit pro uh, corporation setting. So the private sector, not government, but private corporations. And primarily, I'll be focusing on public corporations. As you all know, DEI is under attack in our nation. And what I'll do this evening is I'll describe some of those attacks. And I will lob a few attacks of my own on some of the corporate DEI programs I've attended as part of my research on this issue. So I'll talk about what I think is wrong with corporate DEI programs. I'll talk about how they can be better or what I think would improve them. And I'll do this by considering the difference between DEI work on the one hand and anti-racism work on the other. And I will also look at how some companies have responded to recent attacks on DEI. Now, it may not surprise you looking at me, but my focus is going to be on, well, it shouldn't surprise you because it's in the title, but my focus is going to be on um, attacks on DEI and what they mean for black people in the United States. And the reason why I use that very clumsy statement, black people living in the United States, I'm including African Americans, I'm including uh, black people from Caribbean descent, black people who recently immigrated to the United States from Africa. And my question is whether we need to brace ourselves for an acceleration of the ever-widening racial wealth gap and racial income gap as a result of these attacks on DEI. What impact is, are these attacks going to have on individuals, on families, and in communities that are predominantly African American? And I think important for all of us today is what the impact will be on our entire nation. Now, I'm clear that attacks on DEI will impact other people of color, members of the LGBTQ plus community, the disabled. There's so many marginalized groups who will be impacted by these attacks on DEI. But I focus on black people not because our issues are more important than the issues other people of color face or other marginalized groups face. But I think that we need, I focus on African Americans because we need to talk about these issues one issue at a time. When we lump together all people of color, when we lump together all marginalized groups, we emphasize similarities, but the differences get lost. And the analysis is not going to be deep enough. It's extremely important, I think, to consider the relationships of non-black people of color with public companies. Um, but I like to do it, as I said, one group at a time. I also focus on African Americans in this recent project that I'm doing because the attacks on DEI are based on the same statutes that were enacted decades ago that were intended to protect black people in the United States. Another reason for my focus on black people living in the United States is that corporate statements, as you all know, proliferated after George Floyd's murder and after the advent of the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, the statements that corporations issued after George Floyd's murder were very different from the corporate discourse on race before his murder. Um, historically, corporate leaders said nothing about race absolutely nothing. They started to talk about it a little bit more, but the statements were very different in 2020. U.S. corporations made more announcements about diversity and anti-racism in the months 
following George Floyd's murder than in the many decades and even centuries before his murder. Another reason for my focus relates to the Stop Woke Act. That's another reason for my focus on African Americans. Just two days ago, a federal appeals court upheld a lower court that blocked Florida from enforcing its Stop Woke Act. That act would restrict how private corporations teach diversity and inclusion in their workplaces. Now, according to Wikipedia, don't worry, the rest of my sources are from more reliable <laughs> places. The word woke derives from African American vernacular English, and it means being alert to racism. So clearly, black people are on the minds of DEI attackers, Governor DeSantis, and the rest of the anti-wokeness folks. Now, things have changed in corporate America after business leaders made these grand pronouncements about diversity, but black people are still dramatically underrepresented at all levels of corporate hierarchies other than the very bottom of these corporate hierarchies. And my question this evening is, will progress be reversed in the face of present-day attacks on DEI? And will corporate America fight for DEI um, in the way they made these pronouncements? They said it was important. Will they still consider it important? Did they mean what they said in 2020? Now, 20 years ago, I wrote an article called Diversity Doublespeak, and it's based on a very old book by William Lutz, where he defined doublespeak, not diversity doublespeak, that's my idea, but he defined doublespeak, and he said it's language that makes the bad seem good. And unfortunately, I've concluded that much of corporate discourse about diversity, equity, and inclusion is doublespeak. The three words, diversity, equity, inclusion, they're happy words that obfuscate, that obscure the real problem, racism. Racism that still infects corporate cultures, workplaces, boardrooms, and C-suites. These happy words obscure the reality of racially hostile corporate spaces. Talking about diversity alone obscures bad things like racism by talking about good things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that superficial and obfuscating discourse like diversity doublespeak makes for ineffective DEI programs and efforts. Uh, let's see, do I remember how to do this? Here it is. So let's look at the first word, diversity. Um, here are some examples of diversity uh, doublespeak. These statements that you see from Citibank and Morgan Stanley, um, like most corporate statements about diversity, they don't mention race at all, even though the corporate diversity statements in 2020 were inspired by anti-black bias and by George Floyd's murder. Uh, so according to its statement, Citibank embraces the richness of diverse teams. That doesn't say very much. Morgan Stanley wants everyone to feel as though they belong. Um, I don't think that says very much. And in this slide, um, you see some more diversity <coughs> double C. U.S. Bank statement mentions uh, the value of different experiences and perspectives, nothing about race. Meta statement is about hiring people with different backgrounds and experiences and bringing the world closer together. But what about the E in DEI, equity, achieving equity? <coughs> this shouldn't be a difficult task. <coughs> Just look for the inequities. Install a program, a compliance program, that investigates and monitors. Ask the right questions. Is there pay equity? Is there promotion equity? Is there general opportunity equity? Corporate boards and officers, if they look, they will find inequities. Why? Because corporations are microcosms of the society in which we live, because we haven't ridden ourselves of the racism problem in our country. So they're going to be in our corporations. So they'll find the inequities. And when they find them, they should acknowledge them. They should address them. They should record the inequities and the action that was taken so everyone knows this is something the firm does not tolerate. 
But too often, companies talk about equity, they do very little to attain equity. Companies simply cannot create equity without finding where inequity exists. Just look for the unfairness, and you will know it when you see it. It's very easy to spot. I'm not used to working with a mouse. I haven't done that one. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, uh, with, with Sarah Boston, who started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes that's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, and they're thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now. Gets again cucumber. because I promise not to reveal um, what I see. That, that, that one, let's see. Great, thank you so much. Um, and so I attended this program at this very reputable, large, publicly held corporation. And the person who did the training was from outside of the corporation. And she started that session by reciting the lyrics to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He had a very shiny nose. And she was using this as a metaphor for people of color, that we look different. And she was trying to make the point about inclusion, what happened with Rudolph, and the fact that all of the other reindeer, I can't remember the lyrics now, they never let poor Rudolph play in any reindeer games. I had to run through the whole song in my head to get to that line. Um, and then when Santa comes, he includes Rudolph, everything is okay. And so her message to people of color in that DEI program was, just hang in there, you'll be 
be included eventually. And I think that says, illustrates everything that's wrong with some diversity training meetings. Um, as you can see, this slide about inclusion from Charles Schwab says next to nothing, but it sounds good. It's inclusion double speak. Uh, and here, I don't know if you could read the words there. I think it reflects what many people feel, or at least some people, when they hear the words inclusion. Um, we've concluded that an alarming percentage of the population are experiencing involuntary eye rolling at the word inclusion. So even though I criticize some of the DEI programs I've researched, I do not want companies to stop their effort, efforts. I just want them to get better at it. So at this point, for me, the question becomes, what needs to happen to make DEI work meaningful and effective? And here are my thoughts on this. We should never talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion without talking about anti-racism and the fact that racism is still a problem. Diversity gets people of color into corporate workplaces, into corporate boardrooms, into C-suites, but racism chases us away. Racism is the source of the need for DEI. Many corporations celebrate diversity while their non-white executives and managers and employees and board members uh, deal with disparities stemming from racism. And at this point, I need to emphasize that DEI and anti-racism are not the same. DEI is a type of corporate social responsibility. It's one of many social issues on which a corporate board may choose to focus. DEI is voluntary work. It doesn't have to be done. There are no requirements that a company create and implement a DEI program. But lack of diversity in corporate workplaces and boardrooms and C-suites, that is a manifestation of racism. And anti-racism efforts that address discrimination are mandatory. All companies must comply with law, including the law that prohibits discrimination. Compliance involves, and I'm quoting now, the processes by which an organization seeks to ensure that employees and other constituents conform to applicable norms. And those norms may be internal. They may simply be corporate policy. But for the most part, when we talk about compliance, we're talking about external law and regulation. So installing effective processes and systems that measure compliance with law, including the law that prohibits discrimination, that's mandatory. Mandatory. Now, at this point, I need to acknowledge that even though compliance is mandatory, the quality of that compliance is completely within the discretion of corporate officers. Officers may simply choose to do the bare minimum when it comes to compliance. And corporate boards may look the other way and fail to require more than the bare minimum. Sometimes compliance programs are mere window dressing, just cosmetic. As one commentator wrote, many compliance metrics track activity rather than impact, thereby demonstrating that compliance may be busy you're busy going to this meeting and that meeting and looking at this training program. They may be busy, but not necessarily effective. Frank and I had a great lunch today, and we talked about how compliance wasn't taken seriously decades ago. And now, now it has become a growing area of the practice um, of law for corporate lawyers. There's another distinction between DEI and compliance that comes to mind. Based on the programs I've attended, DEI programs often seem to involve attempts to make people more introspective. And in my research, I felt as though one of the goals of DEI was to change hearts and minds. And quite frankly, I don't care about hearts and minds. I don't care whether racism is implicit or explicit. The reason why I don't care about hearts and minds, think about the Montgomery bus boycott. boycott. Black people before the boycott had to get out on the front of the bus, pay their fare, get off the bus, go to the back, sit in the back. The boycott
boycott was successful. And after the boycott, black people could sit at the front of the bus. I don't think that the white person next to, sitting next to the black person, I don't think that person's heart or mind change. All I care about is changing behavior. And I think that's what matters to most people. The mandatory nature of compliance doesn't encourage the attempt to, form what, to perform what I think is the impossible task of changing hearts and minds. Compliance changes behavior. Now, with the recent calls to dismantle DEI, I realize that including anti-racism as part of DEI programming makes both anti-racism work and DEI work even more vulnerable to attack. And here's what I mean. Some of the recent attacks on DEI were brought by shareholders uh, who sent letters or filed litigation against at least 25 companies. Starbucks was one of those companies. Um, they were sued by a conservative think tank that owns 56 shares of Starbucks. So this Starbucks shareholder slash conservative think tank accused Starbucks of violating uh, Title Seven of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Section 1981. The think tank alleged that Starbucks officers breached their fiduciary duty to shareholders by embracing policies that violate anti-discrimination. And what has Starbucks done? It had announced that it wants to see at least 30% of its U.S. workforce at all levels um, with black, indigenous, or people of color by next year, actually, by 2025. The company also planned to use workforce diversity measures to help set the pay of its executives. Some companies backtracked on their DEI commitments <coughs> when shareholders threatened to sue them. Starbucks didn't, but Coca-Cola did. In 2021, Coca-Cola's general counsel wrote to its outside law firm saying that 30% of any new legal work for, for Coca-Cola should be performed by lawyers who are women, LGBTQ+, disabled, or racialized individuals. And the suit against Coke was brought by the same nonprofit law firm that represented Starbucks in its lawsuit. So the next year, that general counsel was replaced by a general counsel who then wrote the law firm that was representing the plaintiff saying, well, she had already contacted the law firms who received the letter about having 30% of the work being formed by marginalized groups. And she said that while the company remained fully committed to advancing DEI in the legal profession, she had contacted those firms telling them that these guidelines were never company policy. So you see this back sliding, backtracking. By the way, both Starbucks and um, Coca-Cola have had trouble with respect to the relationship of African Americans to the corporation in the past. Texaco and Coca-Cola in the 1990s, um, those were companies against which huge class actions brought by over a thousand African Americans were filed because of blatant overt racism in the workplace, the use of the N-word, um, all sorts of racial slurs um, and discrimination in promotion and pay. That was Texaco and Coke. And we don't see those kinds of class actions anymore because of procedural issues, not because black employees do not still face these kinds of issues in some corporate workplaces. And you all remember the more recent incident with respect to Starbucks and one of Starbucks employees calling the police to escort out two black men who were had not purchased anything in Starbucks, but were waiting for a meeting. And other groups have requested, not for shareholders to go after companies, but they've asked the EEOC to, to investigate diversity practices at several high profile corporations. This is very unusual without a formal complaint having been filed. Um, and companies who have faced the EEOC investigations are Amazon, IBM, American Airlines, J.P. Morgan Chase, Black, BlackRock, Macy's also. Um, by the way, in 2019, before Black Lives Matter, before George Floyd, 
Macy's announced that it had a goal of having 30% so-called ethnic diversity among its leadership. Um, and they wanted to do this to serve its customer base, which is 50, more than 50% non-white. It too had a leadership training program for selected managers of color. And Macy's announced that it was sticking with its DEI strategy, but a spokesperson also said, well, we might express that strategy differently in the future. Amazon, they also stuck to their guns after being investigated by the EEOC, the EEOC because of a program that it offered to assist black and brown contractors. The response of <clears throat> most companies was to modify programs that were initially created for people of color by removing any references to racial groups, by removing any language about numerical diversity targets. And then last year, 13 attorneys general sent a letter to Fortune 100 companies to stop DEI programs at their companies. And I just want to read you the language from the AG's letter. We write to remind you of your obligations as an employer under federal and state law to refrain from discriminating on the basis of race, whether under the label of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or otherwise. Treating people differently because of the color of their skin, even for benign purposes, is unlawful and wrong. Companies that engage in racial discrimination should and will face serious legal consequences. The attorneys general, the, in their letter, they quoted the recent Supreme Court affirmative action case saying that eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. And then the AGs asked the corporations to comply with race neutral principles in their employment policies and in their contracting policies. These attacks on DEI, these kinds of attacks, are recycled iterations of a disingenuous conversation we've seen before. These activists use legislation that was designed to protect black Americans to destroy DER, DEI. They're challenging diversity programs for contractors, for example, also by using a section of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which prohibits race discrimination in contract agreements. The law was originally intended to protect formerly enslaved people, but some conservative activists are citing it to challenge programs designed to benefit the descendants of those people. But Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, they were not passed in a vacuum. They were initially and expressly designed to remedy centuries of exploitation to which black Americans were subjected. These attorneys general, as one commentator noted, seem to want to redefine the very defini definition of racial discrimination. And this particular commentator wrote that the Republican attorneys general suggests that our current environment differs so substantially from where the country was in 1964, when Title VII was enacted, that our definition of what constitutes discrimination must change. The attorneys general suggest that America has solved racism. So in the 21st century, laws that protected black people should now be used by agreed non-blacks in order to support race neutrality. Now, I'm going to use a term of art to describe what I think adequately depicts race neutrality in 2024. It's absurd. I don't have any other word for it. Look at the persistent racial disparities in wealth and income between black Americans and white Americans. And black people don't experience race neutrality in our everyday lives. Um, this reminds me of a book written by Ra uh, Randall Robinson, who was the uh, founder of Transamerica. He wrote a book a while ago called The Debt. And in his book, he has a story about Jesse Jackson, who was visiting New York after uh, for a meeting with some uh, world leaders. And he comes back to the lobby of his hotel dressed in a suit. And he sees an elderly white woman struggling with her luggage. 
There, were, there was no one around to help her. And so he helped her with her luggage and he went ahead with what he had to do. And she came over to him and he thought she was going to thank him. Maybe he recognized her. She extended her hand. He thought he was going to shake her hand. And she put $2 in his hand and said, I couldn't find a bellman anywhere. I call these kinds of interactions professional misidentifications. And they're more than insulting and annoying and inconvenient for, for black Americans. They represent perceptions and presumptions that some people have about black Americans. Dean Schwartz mentioned that I co-authored a book on predatory lending and the destruction of the African American dream. In that book, we describe a study about negative stereotypes that were held by the study participants about African Americans in both the 20th and the 21st centuries. And one of the most prevalent adjectives that, were, that was used by 20, 20th century study participants was that African Americans were lazy. And the other one was that African Americans lacked mental acuity. Um, they didn't use the term mental acuity, they just said unintelligent. And while not explicitly held in the 21st century, these stereotypes still infect perceptions about African Americans. In the 21st century's study participants, they use different adjectives. Aggressive was what they used to describe African Americans. Materialistic was an adjective they used. And this reminds me back in 2015 when Jeb Bush was attempting to get the nomination for the, from the Republican Party as, uh, to be its candidate for president. Someone asked Bush how he would attract black voter, voters. And he said, our message is one of hope and aspiration. It's not one of division and get in line and we'll take care of you with free stuff. Our message is one that is uplifting, that says you can achieve earned success. And when I heard this, I remember thinking, where's my free stuff? I mean, this is the 21st century perception that some powerful non-black Americans have about black about black Americans. And as Bush suggested, many think that black people want to get in line and have white America just take care of us with free stuff. We want free stuff like DEI. Bush's message to us was that we can achieve earned success, suggesting that success that some of us have earned was, or some of us, that some of us enjoy, that it wasn't earned. It was given to us. It was the free stuff. Not only do black people not get free stuff, we pay more for the stuff we get. So in the book about predatory lending, we were describing a context in which hardworking African-American home buyers were, pay, were paying more for mortgages than similarly situated white borrowers with the same credit history. Predatory lenders, venerable, Financial institutions, Wells Fargo, Citibank, Chase, all of them targeted African Americans to steer them into costly, high interest subprime mortgages, even when those African Americans had good credit histories, excellent credit histories, even when white customers received lower cost prime loans with inferior credit histories. And this happened to working class, middle class, and even affluent black people. They were steered into these high cost predatory loans. And because they didn't receive the lower cost prime loans for which they qualify, millions of African Americans have lost homes. And millions of others today in 2024 are struggling to keep homes, attempting to navigate uh, mortgage modification process with their banks that is also predatory. We found a victim blaming narrative when we did the research for that book, that black borrowers took out and continue to enter into mortgages for homes they can't afford. Uh, it really does reflect the adjectives used by the study participants, aggressive black borrowers, materialistic black borrowers, were seeking the success of home ownership that they simply hadn't earned. I want to em emphasize that the steering of black borrowers into predatory mortgages was intentional. 
it's clear that much of the predatory conduct was motivated by explicit and conscious anti-black bias. Wells Fargo was sued by almost everyone. <laughs> Shareholders who had invested in securitized mortgages that were pooled and packaged, they sued Wells Fargo. Cities where homes had been foreclosed on and, um, and, and abandoned, they sued Wells Fargo because of the deterioration of the neighborhoods and the city had to pay for firefighters to come in. Um, and of course, the borrowers sued Wells Fargo. So there were many suits. And former loan officers testified in depositions. And they said that it was pervasive, not just in one Wells Fargo branch, but, in, but throughout the company, that black people were just not savvy enough to know when they were not getting a loan for which they qualified. That was an explicit statement in some Wells Fargo uh, branches. We don't know whether white Americans are more savvy about mortgages because white Americans weren't targeted in the way black Americans were systematically targeted. And then when they wanted to refer to black people in code, they called black people mud people. Another former Wells Fargo loan officer said that the um, subprime loans were called ghetto loans. Well, a little bit of DEI at Wells Fargo, along with some anti-racism work, would have helped a lot. The disingenuous argument that enough has been done for black people is cyclical. We've seen it before. It's an argument that's rooted in bigotry and the idea that white people have wealth because they deserve it and black people who do not climb as high in corporate hierarchies are where, where they are supposed to be. We've seen this cycle many times. After the emancipation of enslaved African Americans, there was a Reconstruction era. There was huge success for black Americans politically, socially, economically. And the success of that Reconstruction era, era was followed by lynching, followed by the growth of the KKK, and also by sanctioned, state-sanctioned segregation. And then in the Civil Rights era, from 1954 to 1968, we've seen the diminishing of though that progress um, on, with attacks on voting rights and access to home ownership and failing uh, school systems. And then there's the election of President Barack Obama. Remember what happened after his election? All of a sudden, we were in a post-racial nation. Sounds familiar. So what should be happening in DEI programs? Larry, I'm not sure how long I should be speaking. Am I going too long? You can keep going. But, um it depends how much time we're needed for questions. Okay. I think you're scheduled to six, and um, so it's up to you. Okay. So, Just give me a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this is your show. Thank you. Okay, great. I like that. Um, I think this is what D DEI facilitators have to ask why there are disparities between white and black Americans with respect to climbing corporate hierarchies. Either the disparities stem from racism, implicit or explicit. Maybe it's just the kind of bias that makes one person hire another person because that other person reminds the decision maker of themselves, but that's still problematic for people of color. Either it's racism or that kind of bias, or something's wrong with black people. It seems to me there are only two choices, and we know that too many Amer Americans believe there is something wrong with black people. We see that in this study. I think DEI program facilitators should discuss the study. They should discuss the racial income gap, that black Americans take home just 70 cents for every dollar white Americans take home. Facilitators should discuss the racial wealth gap. In 2022, the typical African-American family held 16 cents for every dollar the typical white family had. 
And another useful thing that DEI facilitators can do is to make the point that not all black people live in poverty and existential pathology. But in our national discourse, being black and being poor seem to be synonymous. When we talk about predatory lending, we're talking about the black middle class. When we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're talking about the middle class, the black middle class. People who live in poverty, they don't buy homes. Working and middle class people do. <coughs> predatory lending harmed the black middle class. Black individuals who navigate corporate workplaces or black people who do business with corporations as consumers, as suppliers, they're working class people, middle class people. But economic exploitation drains wealth from the black middle class. And black Americans make up 12% of this nation's black middle class. I was surprised when I did some research and I found out that 61.2% of black people living in the US are middle class. I thought it was much lower than that, based on the conversations we have about being black in this country. And 12% of black adults live in upper income households. So attacks on the well-being of the black middle class impacts a lot of people, and it will impact the nation. I just have uh, two more slides that are um, uh, photos, I think I'm going the wrong way, <laughs> photos that I took just about a month ago on 57th Street and 5th Avenue in New York City. So you can see in the middle of this photo in fading yellow letters the word black. I don't know if you remember that in 2020, Black Lives Matter was written on the street, 57th and 5th, in New York City. And so this is what the word black looks like now. And when I took a photo of where Lives Matter was once, it's not there anymore. Now, Black Lives Matter, the words have been vandalized and the words were restored, but this is not vandalism. This is just erosion. This is just neglect. Now that's not a great place on which to end, so I'll try to end on a somewhat more positive note. I happen to think that corporations are a promising locus for cultural transformation when it comes to race and racism. And it's for a very odd reason that I had this thought. It's because norms are homogenous in corporate cultures. Now in U.S. culture, it's all about individualism. But individualism does not work in the corporate context. Individuals have to conform to the norms and the priorities that are established that are established by the CEO and senior executives. Corporations are not democracies. So if those at the top promote diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism, the millions who work for these corporations and the millions who deal with these corporations must conform, and I think that would be truly transformative. So McGeorge, congratulations on 100 years, and thank you for inviting me to share in your celebration. Any questions for Professor Wade? Could I, could I just throw one question? I, I, I'll have a lot. I'm, I'm, could I throw one, one thing that I took away? There was a lot to take away. I'm glad it's more than one. But, um, <laughs> but there's um, what I'm not, one of the things I was struck by is how um, useless, benign, so benign that they were useless, the diversity statements of a lot of corporate America. And it's fair to assume that under the current environment, the direction is going to be for them to become even more worried and watered down. There's this effort not to offend anyone, and therefore by not offending anyone, you're saying nothing. And, and I don't know where the pressure would come from, and so maybe that would be my question. If, would there be a source that could pressure corporate entities to be more bold and direct in their statements?
statements when there's all these counter pressures right now where you know, DEI, wokeism, all that has become, they become bad words, right? When, when the, a little while ago we, we thought being aware of racism was a good thing, mm -hmm. now it's, it's considered a bad thing, right? They, it, 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 it's been amazing how the other side has managed to take these terms and, and made them into evil, evil terms. So what's going to be the, the fix? I think that those who think that DEI is important, and I agree with you, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think that the statements will be more watered down. I think that they're going to disappear. And it's not that corporations will be concerned about offending anyone. It's that corporations don't want the hassle of having a demand letter coming from a shareholder who's threatening to sue. They don't want to be sued. They don't want to have an EEOC investigation. So I think they'll disappear. Um, but how can those of us who care about anti-racism still encourage them to do what we think should be done in terms of fairness and equity? Um, I think we should do what, what some of the conservative activists are doing. Um, it's, they're not doing anything new, it's been done before, but I think it's even more imperative for progressive activists to buy shares and stock and to become shareholders. And we can file our own demand letters to the corporate board and say, this is what we think you should be doing. You should, and not only should you make these statements, but you should do what you're saying. There shouldn't be a huge gap between what you say and what you do. I don't think that activism um, would be well served in actually suing. I don't think any of these suits would be successful, the suits that are brought by conservative activists, because there's something called the business judgment rule, which presumes that corporate officers and directors are exercising valid business judgment. They always win unless they're grossly negligent, unless they've done no due diligence. Corporate officers and directors always win unless there's a conflict of interest. I think arguably there is a conflict of interest when we talk about DEI, when we talk about who gets privilege, but uh, who is privileged. But I think activism should include this kind of focus on companies through share home ownership. You don't have to hold a lot of shares in order to file a demand letter. I think that's something to NAACP Legal Defense Fund should do. The Urban League should do it. Um, sororities and fraternities should do it. Um, so, yes, hi. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, I uh, was interested in the very last comment that you made about the potential for corporations to serve as a locus for transformation. And the skepticism that you articulated earlier about the extent to which um, discourse about diversity, equity, and inclusion um, of the kind that might happen in trainings, that's what I'm guessing that you're referring to there, um, can be useful. I um, am, am sympathetic to your view that discourse is not a replacement for action, nor should it be. But I um, wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about whether you think that it is completely incapable of affecting the kind of transformation you seek, or whether you think it has a role to play. I think it really has a role to play. And it's connected to Larry's question. I don't think there's any corporate leader who will say, we don't care about diversity, we don't care about fa uh, fairness, we don't want to include traditionally, historically marginalized group. They're not going to say we are racist. They don't acknowledge their racism. I want them to. Not, not the racist, not individual racism, but systemic racism. They always say the right things if asked. And who will ask? The shareholders who are activists who buy shares in the company. Uh, and so the, the, the ask is, the ask of business leaders is to do what you say. Here's our question. Look, you know, do some due diligence. Comply with anti-discrimination law. The dean and I earlier were talking about metrics. Look at the dearth of people of color at the top of your corporate hierarchies and investigate it. So 
So that's the ask, and it's an ask that can come from shareholders who care about these issues. Um, many people say shareholders just care about dividends and, and, and money, but obviously um, you can become a shareholder in order to um, have some sort of impact on the way corporate governance decisions are made. So I think the discourse is useful, but you have to connect the discourse to action. This is what you said, are you lying? You know, and of course they're saying no, then we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, let me ask you, Frank, you. <laughs> uh, a follow-up question in terms of shareholders. The biggest shareholders now, I think, are actually like uh, public pension funds. Yes. Uh, Calpers, huge shareholder. New York, uh, whatever. You yeah, TIAA, New York, Biden. Uh, mm -hmm. And so have you investigated what they're doing? They obviously have far more impact in terms of the sort of thing that Thanks for that. No, I haven't investigated what they're doing. And I, 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 that's a good point and something that I'll take a look at. Um, but I doubt that they'll engage in the kind of activism that I talked about in answer to Larry's question, but they can ask the right questions. Uh, but the question is, do those fund managers, uh, you know, where are they on this issue? I don't know, but I, this, is, this is something that I'll, that I'll look into. Thank you for that. Hi. I just want to say hi, uh, that I'm an employee of the state of California, and we just got a little blurb from CalPERS, and ah. we're, we're raising those issues with, uh, with our corporations, so it would be interesting to Excellent. I'll, I'll uh, see if I can pull it up. Here. Thank you. I really would appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to your email so I can cite to you in my article. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much uh, for this presentation. You know, one of, the, one of the things I really like is you building the case and, um, and laying it out and, and then get into the end and talking about what could potentially happen. You know, because most people get stuck and, well, this isn't working and so we should do away with X, Y, or Z or this is not genuine or it's hypocrisy, which you clearly have proven the case. But then, you know, getting to this issue of the power of governance entities. So I have always believed that any institution that is worth its worth anything around, anything has to do with DER, whatever they call it, has to begin with the governance. Um, and really what do the people that are the trustees, the directors, or in our case, the regents at uh, the University of the Pacific, what is it that they say, what is it they're willing to do, and how does it show up in policy, and then how does that policy then become some form of organizational structure embedded in governance, uh, perhaps even um, looking at the charters or some of the um, uh, kind of uh, governing documents and seeing how do you put equity language in from the charter, embed it into a policy, and then create the policy and so uh, such that it, it becomes structure of how they govern. Mm -hmm. So um, outside of that, I think you're absolutely right. Outside of governance, you're dependent upon goodwill of leaders mm -hmm. who are impacted by a diverse stakeholdership. And in a university context, it could be alumni, obviously, as well as uh, philanthropists and fundraisers. Um, one of the things I think that I think your work is doing, Cheryl, is really, I think, explicitly laying out the issues, but not leaving it there, because what happens is that a lot of people just throw up their hands, mm -hmm. and they say there's nothing that we can do because of the disingenuous and the lack of, lack of accountability. But I do think that we have to continue to find ways to look at the governance structures mm -hmm. um, and really focus in on that and stop focusing on the CEO only and the CEO suite and those people, but really focusing on, on the governance structure. So thank you so much for, for saying that, because I have believed that from, from the from the get-go, yeah. that people say, what is your work? So my work is really working with the governance structure yeah. um, and making sure we're trying to hold the governance structure accountable. And yes, you do other work mm -hmm. with the management and the, and the other stakeholders, but there is no other more important group of people um, than the people that are, have the fiduciary responsibility of an organization. Absolutely, and again, I would say, with respect to your very on-point observation, is that in for-profit corporations, that governance issue is already there because you have to comply 
with the laws that prohibit discrimination. You have to comply. And you know, sometimes that compliance program could, as I said, looks to be cosmetic, mm -hmm. but we already have it built in in a way that should <clears throat> impact people at all levels of the corporate hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It's going to start at the top, mm -hmm. but the people who serve in corporate boards have to say to their executive officers, we the board care about this, and you need to get your mid-level managers and your lower-level managers to implement these uh, compliance programs and take them seriously. Absolutely. And you've got to have an information flow that goes both ways, the, from the board to people, as Caremark said, deep within the interior of the organization. You've got to get that message from the board throughout the corporation, and then the people at the top, senior, management, they need to get information about what's happening at the company. So everything is already there, it's just not being done. Codes of conduct are written, policies are written. They're written and they're put on a shelf, but they're not implemented. So there, it's not a big step that has to be taken. It's not a big step and the affirmative action plans have to be, like you had said, the compliance plan has to be a real one and not a window dressing That's one. Right. So I spend time on the on the affirmative action plans. The University of the Pacific has three campuses, and each campus has an affirmative action plan. And what goes into that affirmative action plan is one of the things that then we say we're being held accountable to. So spending time on the compliance mechanisms that we have available to us are, is really important. People only focus on culture, and there's only so much you can do with culture. The, the culture has to be at the governance level. Yeah, yeah, but I think the CEO sets the culture. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, look at Sam Walton. He had a culture, he, he, he created a culture of consumerism. Yeah. You know, the consumers come first. Sam did that. Look at uh, uh, Jack Welch. Look at, I mean, I'm not saying he's a good culture, yeah, yeah. but yeah. Um, <laughs> look what he did at GDI. Absolutely. Look at what Henry Ford did, a huge anti-Semite, but he created a, I mean, when he did it, it was a privately held, corp I mean, it was a, it was a closely held corporation. He held more than 50% of the shares of Ford Motor Company, but it's a culture that he created that yeah. exists even in 2024. Absolutely. So I think culture is important too. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I do see that our, our time is, I don't want to abuse the privilege because then she won't come back. <laughs> uh, Anytime. Uh, so on behalf of the law school, to thank you for being our second centennial speaker, um, for living up to the promise of your introduction. Um, on behalf of the law school, this is uh, uh, sort of like mostly things that, that taste of Sacramento kinds of oh, things. Oh, nice. So thank, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Also, give her a taste of Sacramento, so we're going to take her out to dinner. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay.